overcast day in 2007, poet Maya Angelou spoke during the ceremony that opened the African Barrel Ground Memorial in New York City. Although she had become frail, she refused the stool that was offered her and instead braced herself against the podium. Surrounded by flowers, she spoke in a clear, strong voice about the importance of the memorial that on that day became the first national monument to focus attention on America's slaveholding past. Angelou's words brought to a close an act of monument making that had taken more than 15 contentious years to bring to fruition. In 1991, the General Services Administration began building a 30-story federal building at 290 Broadway in Lower Manhattan. The structure would rise next to an adjacent government office tower built during the 1960s and 70s at 26 Federal Plaza. Excavation for the new building, two blocks north of New York City Hall, soon revealed human remains. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the site had been a marshy swath of land on what was then the northern edge of the city and had been used for public executions and as a burial ground for the city's large African population. In 1750, one in every five New Yorkers was either African-born or of African descent and some estimates suggest that the cemetery, known on old maps as the Negro's Burying Ground, contained the remains of 15,000 free and enslaved people. What had been a small Dutch city and then an English one during the colonial period grew rapidly during the first half of the 19th century. Inspired in part by the opening of the Erie Canal in the mid-1820s, Manhattan Island's development quickly spread northward and the burial ground was overwhelmed in a very short order. How could the buried remains of New York's dispossessed have survived the city's building boom? Topography and engineering provide us with an answer. On the right is a map of Lower Manhattan drawn in 1682. On the left is a computer-generated aerial view of what the place would have looked like at an even earlier time. Both images show a landscape that featured a varied topography of hills and the kind of low marshy land that had served as burial space. Engineering was needed to prepare the land for efficient city building. Early 19th century regrading projects flattened Lower Manhattan's hills and raised its low-lying areas, like the site of the Negro's burying ground. So, burials that were originally six feet below grade now exist 25 to 30 feet below the city's streets low enough to remain undisturbed beneath the basements of the five, four and five story buildings that blanketed the island during the 1800s. But building a 30 story office building requires much deeper digging. The discovery of intact human remains halted the construction. Stiff community opposition to the project, bolstered by local and national political leaders, led to the mandate that GSA take steps to mitigate the archaeological destruction that its building project would cause. A 1991 agreement to proceed required three things. First, a careful excavation and analysis of all discovered human remains and artifacts. Second, an exhibit for the building's lobby on the burial ground informed by the archaeology. And last, the creation of a permanent memorial at the site of the burial ground that would be able to accommodate the reburial of the remains once analysis was complete. Carefully documented excavations took place in 1991 and 1992 and 419 sets of remains were transferred to Howard University for study that would take more than a decade to complete. Discoveries included symbols delineated by nail heads and coffin tops in Burial 21. Cufflinks adorned the sleeves of the man known to us only as Burial 238. Other burials yielded coat buttons and beads. Many of the bodies had been wrapped in shrouds, so the excavation unearthed the pins that had been used to affix the shrouds. While human remains and the artifacts that accompanied them were being examined by Howard anthropologists in Washington, D.C., throughout the 1990s, the burial site gained recognition for its archaeological importance as likely the only tangible material culture of an enslaved urban population in 18th century America. The Department of the Interior designated a portion of the burial ground as a National Historic Landmark in 1993. And that, and that slide, that's the, the dark line shows the boundary of the National Historic Landmark District. 
The, the red box toward the top is the site of the building on the left-hand side, and then the right-hand side that's kind of shaded, that's where the memorial would eventually go. And the cross-hatched areas, that's where human remains had, had, had been found. Um, but if you can see, I mean, this was an, a, basically an archaeological National Historic Landmark. If you look at that and look down lower where I have um, a box around that, the little dots there, that's where we think there are intact remains. So below all the city streets, there are still burials down there. Below some of the shorter buildings, there are still burials there. So 419 sets of remains came out of the ground as part of this building project, but many, many more are there. The archaeology is still, still remains on, on the site, and that's what this, the National Historic Landmark designation talks about. In addition to the landmark designation, a federal steering committee considered the nature of the memorial that would be constructed at the cemetery site and published its findings in 1993. The committee, composed of design professionals and community leaders, recommended that GSA abandon the construction of a planned four-story pavilion adjacent to the office tower and keep that 15,000 square foot site available for the memorial and for the reinterment of the remains once the work at Howard had been completed. It took nearly four years, but in 1997, GSA finally launched design competitions for both the memorial and for the interpretive center that would tell the African burial ground story to visitors. The memorial's competition program instructed would-be designers to consider the site to be a sacred one as they planned a memorial that would pay homage to the lives, history, and culture of those buried there. They were also told to include a reburial site and to be prepared to participate in public forums that would provide community input into the memorial. GSA received more than 60 proposals for the memorial's design late in 1998 and narrowed the field to five finalists. At that point, the project went into an extended slumber that lasted four years. In 2003, GSA engaged the Philadelphia Regional Office of the National Park Service to help them to restart the project and bring it to fruition. This was when my involvement with the project began. While efforts to create the monument and interpretive exhibits lagged, the years of analysis at Howard University came to an end. The remains and the artifacts were ready to be reinterred at the site, so that work proceeded before the creation of the monument. With ceremonies in Baltimore, Wilmington, and Philadelphia, the remains were carried up the East Coast and returned to New York in wooden caskets carved in Ghana. The caskets were placed in seven crypts and then lowered into a chamber at the western end of the memorial site, close to the new building. By this time, the new office tower was in use, and a black aluminum fence surrounded the memorial's eventual site. The 2003 reburial was an occasion of great celebration. It received extensive media coverage and has been observed annually ever since. By this time, the Park Service and GSA had reestablished contact with the five designers who had been selected as finalists nearly five years earlier and had devised a system for gathering public comment on the competing designs. During evening programs held in each of New York City's five boroughs in mid-June 2004, we started calling this, if it's Tuesday, it must be Staten Island. You know, <laughs> the competing designers presented their plans for the memorial and entertained comments and questions from those who attended. The Park Service also gathered written comments and passed them along to each design team. Following the series of public meetings, the designers were given six weeks to make any design modifications they wished in light of the comments they received. In response to public comments, some designs changed in major ways, while others did not. Eustace Pilgrim and Christopher Davis initially planned a curved descending wall that would carry relief sculptures of ancestral faces derived from West African masks. Their revised design increased the green space, provided seating, and better accommodated the reburial that had already taken place at the west end of the site. Architect Joe DePace designed his Ring of Remembrance as a series of ceremonial spaces, all surrounded by a fence inspired by West African woven baskets. A long mosaic wall introduced a colorful element to the site and a formal altar space it would surmount the reburial site. His design remained unchanged after the public sessions. Architect Rodney Leon's ancestral libation chamber featured a wedge-shaped entry portal which would allow visitors to descend to a circular central court with a map of West Africa at its center. 
His design offered a symbolic return to the homeland from which the enslaved had been stolen. And it invited visitors to pour libations with a circulating water near the entry portal. A curving ramp adorned with African symbols of hope, spirituality, and resilience would carry the visitors back to street level. Leon's revised design changed in just small ways, as did others. He, are, he better articulated the reburial site. Groundworks, a consortium of architects and landscape architects, presented a design that made extensive use of plant materials. The proposal they showed the public called for the use of weathering steel ramps and platforms above a green space bordered by trees. The group's subsequent design, the Spirit Catcher, proposed an earthen bowl as a ceremonial space accessed by a ramp bordered with colored glass panels. 419 weathering steel pickets, one for each burial, would surround the site and represent those interred there. The last of the five competing designs came from McKissick & McKissick, a construction company that traces its beginnings back to the 19th century. The design they presented at the public forums attempted to meld the memorial and an interpretive center into one entity. A bridge at the corner would lead visitors across a moat and into an exhibit building. The design met with little popular support, so they then submitted an entirely new design, one with an undulating green space to represent the ocean passage. The interpretive display moved to a long metal and glass shed. The public had a final chance to weigh in, weigh in on the five revised proposals during the fall of 2004 when we installed design boards at six New York locations and small-scale models at 290 Broadway. We announced the winning design in April 2005 during a press conference and media session held at the site. New York Congressman Charles Rangel, a longtime supporter of the memorial, spoke at the event, and winning designer Rodney Leon fielded questions about his ancestral libation chamber. This was the, the design that had garnered the most support from public and professionals alike. Then began the longer than expected process of turning a schematic design into something that would be buildable and enduring. Through more than a year of sometimes contentious meetings, we worked out the details of the memorial's construction and its message. The fine tuning included reducing the memorial's size, adjusting its angle on the site, selecting two colors of granite to differentiate land and water on the central court's map, formulating a landscape plan for the space above the reinterment area, and improving visitor circulation. The most challenging task involved revising and refining the monument's many graphic elements. We felt it was critical to think, think through the graphics and get them right. Uh, Leon's original design had called for a four-line dedicatory poem to be cut into the paving stones of the central court, repeating as a chant as it swirled to the center. It would read, for all those who were lost, for all those who were stolen, for all those who were left behind, for all those who were not forgotten. On the chamber wall that the visitor would see entering the memorial, the architect had proposed to inscribe a timeline of events. We asked that the designers to scrap the timeline in favor of something more compelling than a page of text cut into stone. Leon agreed and moved the four-line poem from the central court to the entrance wall, making them the first words that the visitor would encounter. This then meant that we needed new text to inscribe on the map, words that would swirl to the center and symbolically carry the visitor to West Africa. Conventional wisdom holds that committees seldom produce good design, but as we had already found during the public involvement effort, the ideas of others could make the memorial better. Looking for something to inscribe into the court led us to the archaeology report that Howard University had prepared. We always thought that it was remarkable that all of those buried here were anonymous. We had no names to attach to any of the remains uncovered at the site. We knew them only through the forensic data that the report conveyed. So we suggested to the architect that we might look there for inscriptions that would bring more humanity to the memorial. He agreed, and I extracted a small amount of identifying text from the report, a burial number followed by a few descriptive words. We felt that it was important that the selection yield a random cross-section of the burials. So using a web-based randomizer like that used in computer solitaire games, I drew 40 numbers between 1 and 419, and then culled the basic information on each from the report recasting these phrases with a unified terminology that would create a cadence while being read. 
On the left, you see the archaeology report page that describes burial 348 as a child between one and two years of age. On the right is the plan for the central court with burial 348 called out. Because the memorial's design includes extensive text and symbols, we require the architect to submit full-scale drawings of all inscribed material so that we might make sure that all was drawn, drawn and spaced properly. When he did so, we realized that none of the letter spacing was consistent, and the African symbols for the curved wall looked stilted and mechanical. The architects had not used a graphic design program, but instead had produced all the graphic work in AutoCAD a program whose lettering function is designed for labeling architectural drawings, not for graphic design. To remedy this, the architects brought graphic designer Pam Liu, and you can see she's on the right, into their office for a month. She redrew all of the graphic material using Adobe Illustrator so that it would look and feel right. While the memorial's design came together, a presidential proclamation created the African Burial Ground National Monument, ensuring that the National Park Service would come on board to manage both the memorial and the visitor center being planned for a large first floor space at 290 Broadway. In the meantime, a smaller space overlooking the memorial site was fitted out as a temporary venue for, the, for Park Service offices, visitor programs, and, and exhibits. You see it here in operation in 2006. And in the, the little map, the, the temporary space is on the right hand side. And then what would become the visitor center is the box on the left. The grave goods found during the investigation had been reburied with the human remains in 2003, but replicas were made for exhibition, placed here on pink felt pads alongside photos of the actual artifacts. During the summer of 2006, construction of the memorial began with site excavation and the pouring of footers in the foundation slab. The stonework, the monument's most expensive component, was fabricated at several locations throughout Quebec by Polycor, a French-Canadian stone company. We inspected the progress of the work in November 2006. Polycor's quarry and plant at Saint Sebastien cut and polished the memorial's granite. Here, being ready for transport, are the polished and incised sections of the curved interior chamber wall. At a small stone cutting shop about 30 minute drive away, we met the carver who hand cut all of the memorial's text. Shown here are the panels that carry the four line poem that would greet visitors. At yet another location in Sherbrook, we visited Hydrocoop Cutting Service, the company that was water jet cutting the map pieces for the central court from the two inch thick sheets of stone that Polycor had provided. There we found that the staff carrying out this piece of the work had no idea that they were cutting the pieces of a map until we showed them a plan of the libation court. They had been supplied with shop drawings that only indicated the sizes and shapes of the numbered pieces, but not their context. Speaking only French, they had not understood why stone of one color was marked L and the other color was marked W for land and water. The first stone shipments arrived at the site in January 2007. These were the curved section of the chamber wall that we had seen being cut in Canada a few months earlier. Using stainless steel anchors, stone installers began attaching the panels to the concrete backup that had been poured during the fall. On the left is a view of the work from the office tower across the street. Construction continued with the placement of capstone units once side panels had been lined up properly. The paving stones that formed the exterior skirt came next, followed by the large polished panels that were attached to the stainless steel frame of the entrance chamber. On the left are the panels carrying the dedicatory poem that would greet arriving visitors. During the years of planning, delays, and false starts, the African burial ground grew in notoriety and served as the subject of both scholarly and popular publications. As a result, it has inspired a growing public awareness of New York's slaveholding past and the role that colonial New York's large enslaved population played in the city's development. The New York Historical Society launched a major two-part exhibition, Slavery in New York, in the fall of 2005. The catalog that accompanied the show is seen on the left. That same year, historian Jill Lepore published New York Burning, her Bancroft Prize winning study of 18th century slavery in New York. In addition, walking tours of Lower Manhattan now make manifest the city's heritage of slavery, a heritage that had been made nearly invisible by more than two centuries of urban development. The engraving at the right shows the slave market structure that once stood at the foot of Wall Street. The memorial has now been receiving visitors for nearly eight years. It has become the place of reflection that we hoped it would be and a permanent reminder of a past that few knew existed.
The sparse descriptions of those buried here, cut into the floor of the libation court, return a measure of identity to the thousands of New Yorkers who the institution of slavery had made anonymous. They also encourage visitors to learn more about what the archaeology revealed and about the city's colonial past and its people. Set apart from the memorial's hardscape is the reburial site. Marked by the seven earthen mounds that recall the seven wooden crypts below, this area offers a quiet but powerful reminder that this is indeed a cemetery, a place for contemplating the lives of those who came before us and the conditions under which those lives were led. With the completion of the memorial in 2007, the Park Service could devote more attention to the design of the visitor center planned for the first floor of the federal building that you see here, the tower whose construction set all of this into motion. That work too has now come to an end with the 2010 opening of the African Burial Grounds Visitor Center. Some are drawn to the to memorial alone, but most visitors are introduced to the burial ground and its significance at the center before they proceed to the memorial itself. And so you can see there on, the, on that map, you're, you enter on, on Broadway, see the visitor center, and then you walk around, around the corner typically, and then see, see the memorial down, uh, down Duane Street. At its core, the center's anchoring exhibit confronts you with a stark reminder of the past, a burial tableau in which lifelike figures of a family stand above two coffins ready for burial, one for an adult, another for a child. Archaeology of the burial ground told us that about 40% of the remains found were children's. With no barrier set between the visitors and these figures, you were invited to contemplate an act carried out thousands and thousands of times at the African burial ground during the 17th and 18th centuries. Other exhibits describe how the labor of those now buried beneath the city's streets helped to shape colonial New York. At the beginning of this talk, I said that Maya Angelou had brought to a close this act of monument making, but that's not entirely true. The words she spoke that day were not about completions or endings. She did not echo the words of Mayor Bloomberg and other speakers that day, speakers who offered the standard tropes about forgiveness and closure. Instead, Angelou talked about the work of knowing that still stretches before us. She said that despite the research carried out, there is still so much more to learn about the people buried there and their impact upon the world in which they lived. She said that we should see the opening of the memorial not as the beginning of healing, but as the beginning of knowledge. The African Burial Ground Memorial has begun to tell the evolving story that Maya Angelou wanted us all to hear, but that story is not fixed and static. It will change as we come to know more and more. As I prepared this talk for you, I reviewed and excerpted some of the comments and guidance offered by New Yorkers who attended the public workshops that we carried out more than a decade ago to help us plan the visitor center. In the aggregate, these phrases can be seen as a poem written by many authors. It's a poem that is rooted in the past, but one that speaks to the present. It is a poem that finds its echo in the challenge that Maya Angelou set before us. The community hoped that this place would become a sacred place, a place of spirits and spiritual peace, a solemn place, a place to pay respect to ancestors, a place for speaking of difficult things, a place for cleansing, a place to make offerings, a place to scream a place of pride and connection, a place to begin a dialogue and educate. Here is a place where the geography of slavery is revealed and dialogue and education can begin with a group of middle schoolers from Queens sitting on a granite bench in front of an engraved map that shows how the present streets of their city overlay a massive burial ground beneath them. Once the desire for education begins, who knows where it will lead? Might this also become a place that helps us to finally engage in the conversation about race and the inequality that persists more than 150 years after the end of American slavery? Can it become a place that inspires us to finally end the ongoing slavery and oppression that still remains throughout much of our world? Time will tell, but the African Burial Ground National Monument reminds us that we're the ones who need to do the hard work to make these things happen.